Hi, everybody, and welcome to Last Week Tonight with me. I'm Arkady Freckman. I'm a New York City personal injury trial attorney. And today we're just going to answer your questions live. We're here in my beautiful office in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. And, um, you know, just let us know what questions you have. And we could chat about it and answer your questions live. And then if you have a more specific um, need for a consultation, and have a more specific question that may be confidential, but it's still free, what you could do is you could just text me to 347-566-9595, and I'm happy to just have a chat with you. I've been doing it all week. In fact, I did one this morning, and um, you know, so we could just chat about it, see if we could help, and then give you our, our opinion and our um, consultation and guidance. So yeah, so that's pretty cool. All right, let's see. Let's see who's in this chat so far. In the live chat, I see Gideon here. He put some popcorns up. Okay, thank you. Thank you for being here. That's awesome. I don't see too many more. So maybe what I could do is I could start by going to the comments and answering a few of the comments, and we could start that way. Um, and then if people have um, you know questions live, I'm happy to do those as well. Let's see. Uh, oh, here's a here's a someone saying. Uh, Gaytree says, "Well, hello there, Mr. Arcady. Hi, how are you? That's another uh, potential you know client that we that we had a consultation with and we spoke with. A very nice lady. So thank you, thank you for being here. That's awesome. And Miss LPL says, Arcady. Hi, Arcady. I have a question, but have to break it up in three parts due to character limits. Oh, wow." That's a complicated question. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, break it up, you know, however you want to do it. You know, we're here for you. Our goal is helping serious injury victims and families. So however we could help you, you know, if you have to break it up, break it up, you know, keep, you can keep it short. The only thing I really ask for, even on the consults, like if you want to book a consult with me, I'm going to probably create a link, which is going to be like that Calendly, which is like a calendar. So basically the way that works is you click the link. And it'll show you my calendar, right? And I'll have open spots in my calendar. So I'll, I'll designate some, some time just to consultations, almost like, you know, office hours. And then you can just book a spot, like a 15-minute spot, you know. And we'll, we'll, I'll schedule a few. That way it's a little easier because sometimes, you know, I just I ask people, hey, what is good for you? And then people are like, I'm not sure when it's good for them, you know what I mean? Or I'm busy. Or, and then it's hard to just connect with, with sometimes. For, it takes a few days just to connect. So this will be a little easier with the Calendly. I know a lot of other people are doing that. So let me see. Uh, Sani is here. He says, Arcady finally caught the live stream. Awesome. Awesome. Great to see you. Yeah, he's a really nice guy. Kevin, how long does it typically take for the investigator to figure out the policy limits on liability? Yeah. So I don't know what you mean by the investigator. That's a question from Kevin, Kevin Christman. Um, I don't know what you mean by the investigator. I mean, usually the policy limits. There's two ways you could learn the policy limits. Number one, like here in New York, you could send a letter to the insurance company and the insurance company under insurance law 4520F has to tell you, right? That's the New York State insurance regulation. They have to tell you what the primary limits are. So say you get into a car crash, you know, you're the victim. You want to know what the defendant who hit you has. You ask them, they have to tell you in writing. Now, some states like New Jersey, they don't have to tell you. So they'll just say, we're not going to tell you because we don't have to. So then the other way to find out is by filing a lawsuit. Now, when you file a lawsuit, they have to tell you. In New York, there's like two or three different laws that all say they have to tell you, even without you asking, they have to tell you what the primary limits are and also any excess umbrella, supplemental or concurrent, meaning any other policies that are available to cover this injury other than the primary insurance policy that they already told you about. So it's like stacking. You got the first layer, you got the second layer. It's like an onion. You want to get all the layers. So that's important to, uh, you know, to do that. So, yeah, but I don't know what you mean by investigator, but yeah, that's usually, it doesn't take long. I mean, the letter in New York, for example, just takes maybe 30 days. The, um, the lawsuit, I mean, that could take a little longer because you file a lawsuit, they have 30 days to appear, but then once they appear, you know, you could probably get that within the next like two to three months after they appear because you have to get a preliminary conference and have a judge order it. You could serve a demand for discovery and get all the 
insurance. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't take too long at most, I would say, you know, something like that, like, like 90 days, I would say approximately. Okay. And then smile says, can you talk about artificial disc replacement in the neck? Um, I don't really hear much about that. Yeah, that's a new procedure. I mean, basically a fusion is when you remove the disc, right, from the vertebrae. So I can show you like on a little on a little model. I mean, basically it's like, actually it's so funny. Here's a, here's a disc, this is a disc. And you can see, actually when you squeeze this, it actually uh, herniates. But today I was actually playing with it while I was on the phone and believe it or not, the thing ruptured. So look, there's a, I don't know if you can see, there's a hole in it now. So if I squeeze it, it's actually gonna like, oh, <laughs> the actual jelly comes out. Oh, I'm gonna make a mess. But I just broke it, so I'm gonna have to <laughs> return it on Amazon or get a new one. But it's only like 20 bucks, that's not a big deal. But anyway, but yeah, yeah. So anyway, so the way it works is these herniations, this is what they're removing, and they're putting in like an allograft in there in place of the, um, the disc. So this is the vertebrae, the white part. And so th that's the standard way. But what you're talking about is artificial replacement. So what they're doing is they're taking out your, you know, your human disc, the one you're born with, this red one, and they're putting in an artificial disc. So I, if that surgery works, and you have to really speak to the doctor about that, like how successful it is. But if that surgery works, I would think it's better, right? Because rather than having this all fused with metal, um, this way you, you still are able to bend. You're still able, that, that's how it works when you have a lot of it, you know, you're, you're bending, you're you're, um, you know, obviously you don't want it to be, you don't want to get stuck, you know, where you can't bend because you have rods in your, in your lumbar spine or in your neck, you have a, a plate with screws and everything's, I mean, that's the reason they do it because they're hoping that everything will unify or bridge, but sometimes, it, and most of the time it does, sometimes it doesn't bridge. And then you need a, another surgery that's known as non-union. That's very, very dangerous and very, very serious. So. So artificial disc replacement, I could actually do a verdict search. I don't know, you know, what the verdicts are, but I could do maybe a verdict search. Cause like I said in my, I don't know if you watched that video earlier this week, I talked about lumbar spine uh, fusion surgeries. And I talked a lot about verdicts. There was one for like 20 something million. There was one for 5 million in a construction accident. So artificial disc replacement verdicts, that would be interesting to research. I, maybe I'll do that. I'll try to do that next week. Let me just actually write that down. It's a good idea. Thank you for that question. You see, like that we get these lives and you get like brilliant questions. Let me let me let me write that down so I don't forget. Um, artificial disc, uh, artificial disc replacement uh, verdict. See, I'll do a I'll do a little um, a video. I have to do a research. I got access. Like I said before, I have Lexis, which is a database. I have um, you know Westlaw, which is a database. But then I also got access to some other ones. There's something known as like law.com and they, they write a lot of the, like the New York Law Journal and a lot of the National Law Journal and they keep with something known as the jury verdict um, search or verdict reporter. And they have a lot of verdicts. They have, you know, and the way they work is you put in like the state, you put in the name of the attorney and you could search. So I could do that maybe, or you could put the injury. They have some injuries are, you just click the box. But some injuries are you have to write it in. But either way, I'm, I'm sure they have some for artificial disc replacement because that's something that people get. So we, we should do that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into that. I'm I'm guessing like if I had to guess now, I, I'd probably say it's a little less than fusions because maybe it's a little less invasive. You don't have that permanent um, rod and screws and you know the fusion. They have allograft, so they're taking parts of your you know your hip and there's this cancellous tissue and then they're also like cutting the vertebrae, like above and below, they're cutting this vertebrae because they're trying to get this all to bridge together. So they're cutting into the vertebrae to get it to bleed with a bird drill. It's like, it's a serious thing, but you know, some people need it. That's the only way to get better. Okay, and then Leonardo says, hello, hi. Michelle Williams says, I've looked everywhere for slip and fall at a business that resulted in quad complete tear and open knee surgery. Wondering how much that would be. Okay, slip and fall at a business. I mean, with slip and fall cases, it's hard to like guess what the verdict will be because of the issue of liability, right? Like who's at fault? That's the big like elephant in the room. Now, if you have liability against the defendant, like for example, you fell, it was dark, they had this dangerous condition, like a hole, there's no way you could have seen it and you could show, look, 
you guys are 100% at fault. That's hard to do in slip and fall cases because, they, you know, they're invariably they're going to blame you. They're going to say, hey, you should have looked where you were going or you've been here before. You know, there are a lot of defenses to slip and fall. So slip and fall is not easy. But if it if you could establish liability, then those injuries, I'm thinking, you know, those are serious injuries, like a quad complete tear of your quadriceps muscle. That's a, you know, that's a major muscle in your leg. So that's a serious, serious injury and open knee surgery. I mean, I have to look at the actual operative report, what type of knee surgery. I don't know if you mean like a ACL reconstruct or if it's a total knee replacement because there are different types of knee surgeries. But I mean, all of them are, I guess, open to well, arthroscopics aren't necessarily open because they just put in the arthroscope and then the camera sees inside. They fix the meniscus or they fix the um you know, the tear. So that's, I guess that's not really so open. Depends on the type, but that could be big. It also somewhat depends on where, right? Because some places are more conservative than others. Some are more, uh, but yeah, I mean, I would say here in New York, an open knee surgery like that with a complete tear of the quad, if, if you have good liability against the business, I mean, that could easily be over a million, I would say, easily over a million. That's serious, you know, very serious. So yeah, if you need a consultation on that, just text me, 347-566-9595. I got all this gunk. I was surprised. I didn't think there was anything in there. I thought it was just like bulging out. And there's actual jello in there. It's fun. I'll just get another one of those. Okay. Oh, here's the three questions from before. Miss LPL. Okay. I had a slip and fall in Nassau County, had a fracture in the leg that resulted in CRPS. I recently had a permanent spinal stimulator put in for the leg and T12 for a lumbar injury. There were radiology errors in the first surgery. They put a box impinging a nerve, had to spend two weeks in the hospital getting two revision surgeries. I now have a horrific new pain in the left hip. Is this added to the value of the original slip and fall or is it a separate suit for the hip injury? What do you value unlimited insurance liability? Good, thanks so much. So, I mean, yeah, I'm sorry that that happened to you, first of all. That's that's terrible. That's a real serious injury. But I think that it's a good case. I mean, Nassau County is not the best venue, although you can get a fair jury in Nassau County. You just have to spend a little more time talking to the jurors and weeding out the ones that are more, you know, for the insurance companies and for the defendants and all the people that believe in tort reform, you know, all this stuff. So um, the slip and fall. Again, it would depend on the liability. So the liability is good. So that's uh, so that that's very important. I would get an expert on liability, like a safety engineer, really, you know, shore up liability so that your chances of getting as much as possible on liability go up, right? You want if you can get 100% liability, you know, beautiful. But even if you get like 70%, that's still good. 65%, that's still good. So you want to get as much liability as you can against the people you are suing. Now, um a fracture in the leg with CRPS, if it's real CRPS and you have a doctor, like a neurophysiologist who can diagnose it and he has, you know, like an EMG or the sympathetic skin response, the SSR, the testing, that is irrefutable, right? Because it's it's not uh, what's known as subjective. Subjective is like, you know, you're the subject. I like, I, like if you ask me, hey, do you have pain? I say, yes, I have pain. I could be lying, right? I'm the subject. It's subjective. Anybody could say anything. But objective means you do a test and medically it's objective. Like we all agree, hey, this is what this person has. So if you could have that proof, of objective proof of CRPS, that could be, you know, multi, multi-million. I've seen CRPS cases go for 12 million, 18 million, like, you know, crazy numbers. A lot of them are not in New York. A lot of them are in California, other states, but New York could have it too. Like the, I did a CRPS case. I did a video about it. It was a smaller, it was like a small laceration to the leg. And we got over, it was like 535,000, I believe, 530,000. So yeah, they, they, you know, that, so compared to that, this is much more serious. Now you also say a spinal stimulator. So that's a permanent implant and you have a um, T12 lumbar injury. So yeah, that's real serious. Now, the fact that they they made errors and they put in the, the spinal stimulator or some kind of box impinging on the nerve and you had additional revision surgeries for that, what you could do with that is if there's enough insurance in the slip and fall, just add it to the slip and fall because there's something known as natural sequelae, right? Which means that everything 
flows from the original injury, the, the slip and fall. The slip and fall is what originally caused these injuries. And then you have natural progression of treatment. And it's like foreseeable by law and the pattern jury instructions that you could have medical malpractice, right? If a doctor may make a mistake. Now, it might be medical malpractice in the sense that he makes or she makes a mistake, or it could just be like a bad outcome. And that's all foreseeable, meaning it's something that, you know, you could foresee, you look ahead and that's something that could happen. So it did happen. So it all goes back to the slip and fall. So if there's enough insurance, if they have like, say, a million with 10 million excess, if it's like a big company, like at a Walmart or something, yeah, do that. That's better. Now, you could also sue the doctor for the mistake, but that's a little different now because now you have to get another lawyer or maybe your lawyer who's handling this case can do medical malpractice as well, but you have to examine all the records, you have to find the mistake, and then you have to get another expert to say that the mistake is what caused the injury, meaning you know it wasn't just an, a mistake, but the mistake is what caused these injuries. So you need, you need like um, uh, negligence, medical negligence, and you also need causation, cause and effect that it caused these injuries. But here it doesn't seem that complicated because it's the additional two weeks in the hospital and all these new pains. So, yeah, it would definitely, I mean, if there's enough insurance, I think it's easier to just do it with the slip and fall. Med mal cases are always tough. They're always hard to win. And I think statistically, if you look at them out of like 10 cases, maybe nine are for the defendant. And a lot of these doctors don't settle because they, if they, if they agree to settle, it kind of means they agree that they made the mistake. So even if they settle for a small amount, what happens is it goes on their permanent record. Like they, they paid out money and it, it's kind of like a blotch. A blemish on their record as a doctor so they have like a lot of pride you know like confidence they don't want to admit it so there's all those factors so i think you know in that sense i would i think it's easier for you to just do the um to do the uh you know the slip and fall case so i hope that's helpful so yeah let's see any other questions i don't know if we have any other questions i don't see anything else in the chat let me see I don't know if it's something wrong with the chat. Seems like it's a little like stuck or something. Oh yeah, maybe it was stuck. Oh, I changed my screen and now there are questions. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's cool. Okay. Maybe my screen was stuck or something. Okay, here it is. Let's see. Um, Stephen Barrett says, if a case is lost, am I responsible for the medical bills that were leaned? Never miss a video. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for being here and for watching. No, you're not responsible. I mean, a lien just basically means that, look, nobody's paying the doctor now, right? There's no no fault. There's no health insurance. There's no method of paying the doctor. So he's just going to take a piece of the pie at the end. Now, if he agrees to sign a lien, he's basically agreeing to a piece of the pie. But if the pie is zero, then he gets zero. So, I mean, I guess depending on how they word the lien, I mean, I could imagine some doctor somewhere might try to go after a patient, but I've never really seen it happen. Usually it's just that they're asking for that piece of the pie. And if the pie is zero, if you lose the case, then everybody just gets zero and they usually don't go after you. Okay. And then Kevin Christmas again says, my attorney's case manager said their investigator is looking into everything. It's been almost 60 days since the semi truck hit my car. Oh, yeah, that's the one about you trying to get the policy limits. Yeah. Oh, I see. Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, if you want, just text me. I'm happy to do a consult. It's 347-566-9595. It's hard for me to say, you know, I don't know what state you're in or, but yeah, I mean, an investigator might just be an employee of the law of the law firm. So it's kind of similar to what I said, where somebody would send a letter and if they answer the letter, then you have the information as a claim, right? Meaning pre-suit before you file. Now, if that if your state doesn't allow that, then you have to file the lawsuit. But in the lawsuit, every state, they're going to have to tell you the insurance limit. So you're going to get it in terms of timing. Yeah, I mean, it's something like that, like 60, 90 days. It shouldn't be too long. OK, Letitia Martin says, I have a question. Can you please answer? I've been in a car accident. I have been waiting a year and 10 months. My lawyer told me three months ago they offered thirty thousand dollars. When I call him, no update. Oh, okay. So, so you were in a car accident and uh, you've been waiting a year and 10 months. You've been waiting almost two years, right? Uh, two more months, it'll be 12, 12 months. So that's two years. That's a long time. And then your lawyer told you that three months ago they offered 30000 So, I mean, I couldn't really tell you much about that. You'd have to call the lawyer. 
if you if he has the offer, it's just a question of doing a consultation with that lawyer. Like go to his office, sit down with him, or do a Zoom like this, or call him up on the phone, text, whatever you know, wh however they communicate, and just say, look, um, you know, is thirty thousand a good number for my case? Should I take it? You know, see what they say. I don't know what your injuries are. If he says, you know, take it, and you think, you know, that's a fair number, you could take it. You'll get the check. If you think it's too low and he can get more, ask him how much longer do I have to wait and how much more do you think you can get? Like, for example, you know, it's always like a balancing act. Like you, you could get 30,000 now, but hey, wait a minute. If I put it in, in the courts and you wait a year, I'll get you 300,000. So for you, it's much better to wait, right? Because then if I get you 300, you're going to get 200 in your pocket. Whereas the guy's doing 30 now, but then you're only going to get like what? 20 in your pocket, even less than 20. So of course, like two hundred thousand is much better than twenty. Like if you got the twenty now, is there any way to turn the twenty into two hundred? Like playing the stock market, or maybe like with this Bitcoin going up? I don't know, but it's pretty tough. It's not easy, right? That's like what ten x your money, right? So probably better to wait. So it just depends. Okay, Bag Boy says, can you do a cervical fusion video soon? Yeah, absolutely. I just did that one on lumbar. I could do cervical as well. Yeah, I just gotta like find some time and shoot those and do a little research and read those cases. Yeah, I'll do, I'll try to do it maybe like next week or the week after. Um, Cause I'm just preparing. I have a trial myself in April. So I'm preparing for that. We were just prepping the witness today and uh, some other stuff uh, going on. I might be away for a few days next week. I'm, I wanted to do a, a conference, a lawyer's conference where you learn more and get even better. One of my friends actually took a verdict yesterday and he got $61 million. This was in Indianapolis. And the trial is actually recorded, so you could watch it. There's something known as CVN, the Courtroom View Network. So I was watching some of that trial, and I thought he did a masterful job. And he's going to be at that workshop, so we're going to maybe um, you know workshop some cases together. And I want to like learn, you know, learn from the best because that's that's really good. Sixty one million. I mean, it was a terrible case. It was like a Tesla car, and not just somebody driving a Tesla, but the actual authorized Tesla vehicle, the one that would come and repair your car if you have a Tesla. So the Tesla truck, and they got into a, a car crash. And at first they said, look, we're not at fault. So they had to do a trial only on liability. You know how they bifurcate the trials? So we have two separate trials, one about who's at fault, and then another trial about damages. So they did the liability trial, and they found that Tesla was at fault 70%. So then they did the, um, the damages trial, and it was a brain injury, a really bad brain injury. And they were trying to discount it and say it's not worth much, you know, and he actually told the jury, look, civil justice, full justice in this case is $190 million because he was he's a young guy and he was saying $5 million a year for you know all those future years. I think it was like almost 40 future years. So like 190, close to $200 million. And he, he that's what he, you know, what they say, that's what he asked for. That's what he told the jury full justice was. But the jury came back with $61 million, which is, you know, I don't know if you ever saw my video before where I talk about the rule of three. Like people always, whatever you ask for, you get like a third less. So if you ask for, let's say, a hundred thousand, you'll get thirty. If you ask for three hundred, you'll get one hundred. If you ask for a million, you'll get three hundred thousand. See, it works out. He asked for two hundred thousand or one ninety, and he got sixty. So it's almost right. Sixty times three is one eighty. So rule of three. <laughs> rule of three. My, that's my theory, but I don't know. It's just my theory. Okay, bad boys says. Is there any other surgery you could ask for instead of a cervical fusion? Because more likely, ran out of range of motion is going to be limited with a fusion. Yeah, yeah, range of motion definitely will be limited because you know they're taking out the the discs. Those are the articulating discs. Those are the ones that move. So your range of motion is going to be limited. So the other one is maybe that artificial disc replacement. If you're a candidate for it, somebody else asked that question earlier in this in this uh, video today. Uh, in this live about artificial disc replacement. So that could be an option for you. I don't, I don't really know, you know too much about that. I've heard about that. I guess they take out your disc and they put in an artificial disc. So it has to be able to move. And then your body has to accept this artificial disc, right? Kind of like when you do a total knee replacement and they put in this um, titanium or whatever uh, knee replacement. So you're, you don't have a knee anymore. You have this titanium but your body has to accept that titanium, that, that foreign body. And so the same thing here, your body has to accept that foreign disc. But I guess now with technology, you know, I don't even know what they make these discs out of, but I, the, the discs allow you to bend and move. 
So yeah, like you would just, I have a, actually I have a, a model. Let me see if I can show you a quick model. Oh, that's kind of all, all the way over there. Well, that's okay. But basically you've seen it. It's the cervical spine. Uh, so yeah, it, it's supposed to bend and move. And if uh, basically instead of fusing it, which is putting uh, rods and screws and having the bone bridge with like bone bridge with bone, like imagine this red part was gone and this bone would be bridged with this bone. This is all one level now. So of course you can't move. Um, and so the alternative is just to replace this disc, right? Put another disc in and that disc will allow you to keep moving. So I think it's better if it works, but I, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I don't want to tell you, you should get, of course, get a consultation. I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, it's an individual thing. Like for some people, the artificial disc is better for other people. Maybe the fusion is the only thing that works. You know, some people might not need anything. They can just do a perk disc, which is like a striker decompressor goes in and it works like an Archimedes pump. And it kind of like decompresses the disc almost like a straw would suction out the leak from the disc. And then the disc is a perfect circle again. You know, that's minimally invasive. That's like a 10, 15 minute procedure in the office. That's, of course, better than doing a fusion, which is much more invasive or, or an artificial disc. There's also like micro discectomy. There's a lot of different procedures out there. So, um, yeah, definitely get a consult about that. Okay. Kayla says... How does a pre-existing condition impact the settlement or verdict? Yeah, so a pre-existing condition. I've done many videos on this before, you know, including like videos where I just talk about this. But I mean, basically to keep it like short, I'll just say a pre-existing condition is whatever you had before you got injured, right? So you can't recover for whatever injuries you already had, but you can recover for however your entire life was made worse so for example let's say you have a herniated disc at c2 c3 you already have it and there's an mri of it you know from two years before the crash so obviously you can't if you've recovered for it or maybe you just have it from you know i don't know playing soccer or whatever you can't recover for it again you know expect the, the, the car crash or the insurance company to pay for it right because they'll just get those records and they'll call you a fraudster because they'll say, wait a minute, but you had this two years ago and you want us to pay for it? So you can't claim that and don't even try because it's, it's a waste of time. But you can claim to the extent that injury was made worse. So, for example, if you had the C2, C3 herniation, well, maybe now you have a C3, C4 herniation. And that wasn't on that MRI from two years ago. So you actually showed them the MRIs. I like to be like very transparent, like show them everything. Show them the MRI. Say, look, here's my C2, C3. You know, but now I have C3, C4. This is new. And this is from the crash. And now, you know, pay me for this. And plus my C2, C3 got worse. Maybe before it was like a bulge where it was sticking out a little. But now it's a full-blown herniation where the wall of the disc has ruptured, exploded. And the liquid is leaking out and touching the nerve roots. Like over here, you know, where it's touching these nerve roots. That's what's causing the pain. You can see that's just a partial. The nerve roots just continue. They go everywhere. They become smaller, kind of like tree branches. So, yeah, yeah, you could definitely recover for that. Actually, it was an issue in this case that I just talked about, the $61 million case, and the way the lawyer approached it, because they said, look, he had some you know issues before, and he basically said, look, what are they saying? Are they saying that this human being is damaged goods? Is that what they're saying? And what about to the extent that they you know, changed this person's life and turned this vibrant, you know, a live person. He was like a family man. He loved to do all these different things to the extent that they turned him into, you know, somebody gave, gave him a lifelong forever injury. Right. So I think that's a, that's a powerful argument too, you know, because I mean, we all have something right We're we're born. And as soon as we we're born as babies, we start to degenerate. And that's the, what the word that the insurance companies and the defense lawyers use degeneration but what is degeneration? It's just the normal, painless aging process, right? As you get older, your body degenerates. It's aging. So, of course, you're going to have something. So, you know, so that's yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I'll maybe do a few videos. There's another lawyer who talks about pre-existing, and he, he couches it as baseline, like your baseline reserves how much you have in the tank and also coping your ability to deal with it. So he basically says, look. If, you're, if your baseline, you know, is a 10 or a 9, that means you're really healthy. You don't have anything pre-existing. 
So then if they hurt you in a crash, okay, you go to a seven or a six, but you're still okay. But if your baseline before the crash, because you already had a prior injury, like the C2, C3 herniation I talked about, if your baseline before was already like a six, well, now they hurt you. Well, now you're maybe down to like a three or a two. You don't have much left to give, right? So your baseline goes down. Your reserves are what you have, are kind of like reserves in the tank. You don't have any reserves, right? And then you're coping. How are you going to cope with this? People can cope with a six, but it's very hard to cope with a two. There's almost nothing there, right? So if you spin it the right way, right, if you frame it the right way, like a picture frame, right, you got to frame it the right way to a jury, um, a pre-existing condition could actually turn out to be a positive in the, in the sense that, you know, but you have to know how to do that. Like you have to really study like trial. Like I go to the oh, trial lawyers <laughs> university. I'm just wearing, they have comfortable t-shirts, but they're also very good. They have a lot of lectures and excellent uh, lawyers there. There's a lot of different organizations, you know, but you got to really study this stuff and know it. That's why I'm saying like they're really important for people to get these true trial lawyers, you know, because a lot of people, you know, they just hire these like billboard lawyers because they're just everywhere. You see them on billboards, but they don't know anything. They've never been to a courthouse. Imagine like them going in with a pre-existing condition. They're gonna, it's like it's like sheep to the slaughter. They're going to get destroyed. So, you know, it's very that, that's a good question, but that's that's a tough thing to to prove. But you could definitely prove it. OK, let me get to all your questions. Sorry, I, I, I digress. OK, Ron Jurz says, what is a letter of the court gave us 90 days to certified for trial or it could be dismissed. I saw a letter on track and no future court date. Oh, okay. So yeah, usually, I, I don't know if that's in New York, but in New York, they do have that. It's called a 90 day notice. So basically it just means that nothing's been happening with the case. And, you know, the lawyer who's handling the case hasn't been pushing it along. It's a failure to prosecute. So if the insurance company and their lawyer sees that, you know, the, the case isn't being prosecuted, they could serve you with a 90 day notice to resume prosecution. Prosecution doesn't mean like in the criminal sense, like it means just basically, you know, handling the case, doing something, moving it towards trial. Because if they're just sleeping on the case or they forgot about it, right? Or it's just sitting somewhere in a drawer, like in storage and nothing's happening and they serve them that 90 day notice, if they don't answer the 90 day notice and resume prosecuting, meaning moving the case, it's just going to get dismissed permanently. So be very careful of that. Um, you know, but you could, you could, as long as you respond, you can continue the case. Uh, insurance companies do that when there's no activity on a case for 90 days or, or for longer, you know, and then, and then you have 90 days to resume. Okay. John, John says, I got a mediation next week against the city. Kind of nervous. I hit my head and suffering bad headaches and had to get another surgery on a pre-existing surgery, pre-existing injury. Oh, I see. Yeah, no, I mean, good luck. Hopefully, you know, the city is okay. I don't know which, I don't, I don't know if you mean New York City or some other city, but yeah, the city's okay. If it's New York City, they pay, they pay good money. You know, you just have to go in there and, you know, I hope you have a good faith offer. I've talked about this many times. I, I don't like to go to mediations without a good faith offer because then you don't know what you're going to get, right? It's like, a, it's like what's behind door number one? Is it a beautiful, you know, Ferrari or is it a donkey? You know, that show that used to have prices, right? Uh, what's behind door number one? It could be a donkey or it could be a Ferrari. That's that, that's what you're basically dealing with if you don't get a good faith offer before the mediation because you show up, you're paying $600 an hour for this judge. The judge doesn't care. He's paying $600 an hour. You have these defense lawyers there. You know, you're there with your lawyer. The defense lawyer, they could start off and they could say, look, this case and tell you all the problems with your case and then offer you like, I don't know, 10000 or something or you know, 15,000. And if you're looking for like a million, then they'll just laugh at you. And then you leave and you get disheartened. You get, you know, you start thinking, is my case really that bad? You know, did I make the, you know, that's what they like to do at, the, at these mediations. So you just have to be careful. Like I'll, I'll go to mediations. I've settled a lot of cases with mediations, but you can't only do mediations, right? You have to do The way to be successful at mediations is to win at trials, right? Because if you have a record of going to trial and you have like verdicts, let's say for 3 million, 4 million, 5 million, whatever, 2 million, 1 million. Okay. And then you also go to trial and you settle cases, but during trial or jury selection, like, you know, 500,000, 750, 1 million, 3 million, whatever. Now you can go to the mediation and you can tell them, look, pay me a million. If you don't look at my history, I'm just going to go to court. I'm going to get it from a jury, but I'm going to get more. So if you don't pay me a million in the mediation, I'm going to get two or three from the jury. But if you don't have that, right. And if you just go into mediation, hoping for like them to just pay you, they research every lawyer. They have every all your history. They're not going to just pay you. They're just going to 
you know, pay you a small amount and, and try to dishearten you to get you to not like your own case. It's kind of sad, but that's, that's their, that's what they do. Yeah. Okay. Let me jump back in here and do some more questions. Uh, where was I? Okay. Unicorn is here. Hello, Senor Arcady. Can you give me a call, please? I want to have a sit down with you and an actual real life judge and my family. I want to show everything that has caused my life to be changed. Yeah, sure. Just text me 347-566-9595. Happy to chat. Oakley says, thank you so much for all your content. It has helped me have patience and confidence in my case. I was an LEO and rear-ended by a semi in 2022. We just settled for the policy limits of 1 million. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Awesome. I'd love to hear that. I'd love to hear success stories like that. So yeah, that's great. I mean, if that's the policy limit, you got everything. And I'm sure the lawyer checked if there's, a, there's no excess. You got everything. That's beautiful. That, that's the best you could do. So congratulations. Uh, but unfortunately, I have a permanent spinal cord injury and a traumatic brain injury. But thankful to be alive and through the lawsuit. Your content has been invaluable. Thank you for helping seriously injured people. Oh, no, you're very welcome. I'm sorry to hear about those injuries. Those are horrible injuries. But hopefully you can get better. I wish you the best of health. And that's, what, that's what's important. But that's good that you got some justice. For, by getting the full policy limits, that's probably the best you could do. Oh, and he says, I'm in Indianapolis. Who was the attorney that got the 61 million? Oh, yeah. So that was actually um, Trial Lawyers for Justice. I think you could check them out. TL4J, um, TL4J.com, Trial Lawyers for Justice. The attorney, I think this particular one was Nick Rowley. Nick Rowley, that's his name. He's yeah, a very good attorney. He does cases all over the country. I'm trying to get him to come do a case in New York if we could do it together. That'd be really cool. Oh, and Steven says, do you pay taxes on settlements? No, you don't pay taxes, right? Because it's not income. It's compensation for your pain and suffering. So basically it's like, um, you know, compensation for the fact that you have pain, you have suffering, you've loss of enjoyment of your life, your, your happiness, right? Like happiness is important. Somebody took away your happiness. They took away your health. Now you're getting money to compensate you for that because we're not like an eye for an eye society. Actually, he said that in the $61 million case too. He said, look, we're not an eye for an eye. We're not a leg for a leg. We're not a brain for a brain because his client had a traumatic brain injury. But that's what that's the way we do things in civil justice in America is money damages. So no, but you don't pay taxes. Okay, and then gun trucking. Good afternoon. I was involved in an accident two years ago, had a physical therapy, four steroid shots, and finally a surgery, discectomy, decompression, something like that, was hit by a semi-truck. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, I mean, these semi-trucks are terrible. They're so big, you know, when you get hit by one of those, people always get serious, serious injuries. Discectomy is very serious. My case is about to settle, but the lawyer asked for 500 only. What should I expect the final outcome? The opposition is 100% at fault. Well, I mean, first of all, I don't know. Why would you only ask for 500? Like, remember my rule of three. If you ask for 500, they're only going to give you like 160 or 170, a third of that. I don't know. Why would you? Why would you? That, that makes no sense. First of all, you got to find out how much insurance the trucking company has. Like, well, there are big trucking companies, right? Like DJS, Werner, you know, uh, JB Hunt. They're smaller ones, like little, little ones where there's one truck and there's one guy that's a, owner operator every truck like you know box truck or commercial uh tractor trailer usually is going to have at least a million i mean some cases maybe 750 but rare usually it's a million or more and there's also other avenues of liability like broker shipper liability there's um you know you could sue sometimes the trailer has a separate policy from the tractor uh the, there's a company there's also the driver you know sometimes they have different policies they have excess umbrella you got to look into all that but even if it's only 500 right I mean, i'm sorry even if it's only like a million you got to go for the million with those kind of injuries you're talking about a discectomy that's a serious injury that's a surgery are you talking about a full-blown discectomy or a percutaneous but even even if it's a percutaneous which is with the striker decompressor i got a verdict on a percutaneous in manhattan which is a conservative venue for 548,000. but if you're asking for 500 they're going to give you less you see, so you got to ask for a million. I mean, even if you ask for a million, they're going to give you like 300, but then you can negotiate up if that's all they have, meaning a million, but there's no excess. If there's excess, you could ask for more, or you could do it my way. You know, you don't have to ask high and have them, 
drag you down. You could also just say, look, I examined the case. Here's your limits. You have a million, you have 3 million excess, whatever it is. And you know, the value of this case is 2 million, pay the 2 million, you have 30 days. If not, we're going to court, we're going to ask for 3.5. And then they'll go crazy. They'll give you, they'll give you money. I mean, they might not give you the full ask, but they'll give you significant money that way. That's, uh, that's the best way to do it. That's the window of opportunity, like a settlement window of opportunity. And it's only for like 30 days, right? And that's how you set up bad faith. And other people have asked me, maybe in the in the YouTube comments this week, but that's how you open a policy, right? When people say the policy is open, that means that if, let's say the policy is a million, you write them a letter, you say, hey, pay me the million, you have 30 days here, but you have to like, you, you can't just write a letter, you have to also say, look, here are all my medical records, right? Look at them. These are my injuries. Here's authorization. So you could obtain all my medicals directly from the doctors, you know, and look, here's a research also from like jury verdict reporters and, you know, all the different databases for this kind of injury, a discectomy. Here, here are verdicts. People are getting 2 million. People are getting 1.5. So in good faith, pay me the 1 million. You have 30 days. If you don't, that's fine, but I'm going to go to a jury and I'm going to ask for, like, say, 5 million. And if they give me the 5 million, well, who's going to pay the difference? You have a duty of good faith and fair dealing to your policyholder, right? The trucking company and the truck driver, because they purchased insurance policy and they did, and they're paid premiums for many years. And they paid these premiums because if something like this happens, like an unfortunate crash like this, that they have coverage. But you're refusing to honor that contract, right? Because I'm giving you this opportunity, this window of opportunity, 30 days to pay the million. But you're saying, no, you're not going to pay it. You're going to offer me, you know, whatever, 20,000, 200,000, doesn't matter. So now once that window has closed and the opportunity is over, if I get the 5 million, a lot of states, it depends on state by state law, but a lot of states will say, well, that's bad faith. You've now opened the policy and it's open, meaning there's no, there's no ceiling on it anymore. So even if you get like, you know, I don't know, 40 million, they have to pay the full 40 million. So that's, you know, that's what, so I don't know, you know, but, but yeah, feel free to text me about that. If you wanted to do a consult, three, four, seven, five, six, six, nine, five, nine, five. Okay. Two toy Records says, hi, I was wondering how successful is arbitration for UIM, UM in a lift accident? Do you have to do a deposition for arbitration? Yeah, it depends. I mean, sometimes I'll ask you for a deposition. Uh, a lot of times they will. How successful it is? I mean, I don't really like arbitrations because it depends on the judge, right? You get one judge. So if you get a judge that's like more plaintiff friendly, you might get a good result. If you get a judge that's more insurance company friendly, you might get a really bad result. A lot of these judges, they just want more work. So they just kind of like split the baby and give you something like not something that you can get from a jury, but not something terrible either. So that both plaintiffs and defendants will just continue to use them. So everybody's thinking about their own self-interest. But really, I mean, so I don't know. I just don't like, but if you, sometimes you have to, sometimes you have to uh, do uh, these, uh, you know, arbitrations because sometimes that's the only option legally. So, okay. And then John, John says, I was rear-ended by a city truck, left me with a bad headaches. I take Botox every three months on top of other injections and also had to get another surgery on my knee. Oh, wow. That sounds like a big case. Yeah. A city truck. And if, if it's a bad headache where you have to take Botox injections, you should probably get a, neuro a good neurologist that knows how to do a brain injury workup. And then what you could do there is you could get neuroradiological testing, like a, a MRI, like a 3T MRI of the brain with diffuse tensor imaging, some other testing, you know, depending on what type of injury you have and what the doctor um, believes. There's fMRI, like a functional MRI, where the MRI tests various functions that you're doing. And then based on that, you know, uh, you have a lot more evidence. If you can prove a real brain injury, it could be a multi, multi-million dollar case. Okay, Letitia says, my lawyer told me 30,000 is not enough money to recover my medical bills. I had three fusions. Oh, wow, yeah, if you had three fusions, I mean, you can't, 30,000 is nothing. Yeah, it's worth a lot more. Find out how much insurance there is. And then you should just get the insurance limit usually. I mean, three fusions is, is tremendous. That could be like... Uh, you know, 5 million or more easily. It could be many, many millions. Yeah, if you need a consultation, just text me, 347-566-9595. I'm going to be around tomorrow and maybe over the weekend a bit and uh, next week too. Um, yeah. Okay, Bernie says, hey, I'm the guy who has the herniated disc and I settled with Amazon for the full insurance amount. That was about a month ago. How long does it take to receive the check? 
I mean, usually just like 30 days. The only way it can get delayed is if there are a lot of like these liens, like for example, Medicare, Medicaid, I don't know, like workers' comp liens, uh, liens from doctors, you know, because even once the attorney receives the check, yeah, now the attorney has the check, right? The attorney puts the check in their escrow account. So that's a special account for the client. The attorney, you know, can take their legal fee, their one third or whatever they're charging you, their 40%, 33% out of there. But all the, your money is in there. But now the attorney or somebody in the attorney's office has to start calling all these lien holders, these people that have an interest and negotiating with them and, you know, trying to get them to come down. Because for example, a doctor might say, hey, my lien is 50,000. But if you call them and speak to them, maybe they'll lower it to 19000 So they're saving you money. But so, so it's a good thing for you because then you're going to get more money, right? But the bad thing is that it takes time because you call them, they don't pick up. You leave a message, they don't call you back. Then you forget, then you have to follow. So, so you know, it's, it's like time versus money. You know what I mean? Like you want, you want to call all these liens to like lower them. But at the same time, you want to get your client paid as soon as possible. So that's, that's actually an important role in any law firm is the lien negotiator. There are actually companies out there that do that too. And Bernie also says, I have four herniated discs. Um, oh, wait, I lost the. Oh, here it is. Uh, I don't know what happened. I think I lost the chat there with Bernie. Oh, yeah, I have four herniated discs and have a TBI and mild aphasia. So I was very happy with the settlement, but it's taking a while to actually receive the payment. Is a month a good time frame to get paid? Yeah, usually a month, I would say, about a month. Like, like I said, but if there are liens, it could be a little longer. Okay, and then Truth Seeker says, Arcadia is the best. Definitely like the stream, guys. Arcadia, the defense in my case, submitted the video footage of my injury to the judge and my attorney, but we haven't received it yet. Why would they? Uh-huh. They submitted the video footage of your injury. You mean of your, like, your injury happening, like your fall or your crash? Uh-huh. I mean, it's hard to say why would they. I mean, you you could see it too. I haven't really heard of them submitting it to the judge without exchanging it with you. Um, I don't I don't really know. I mean, they have to submit it if they have it. Like if they have surveillance, for example, if your attorney requested the video surveillance and they have it, they have to submit it whether it's helpful or whether it hurts them, uh, just by law. So probably that's why. But you should get a copy of it, and your lawyer should too. Okay, Melanie says, it's been four years and the defendant asks for more time and they requested us to do depositions of my surgeons. Is this common? And when I ask my lawyer how it's going, she just says it's okay. Okay, so four years and the defendants want more time and they want to do depositions of your surgeons. Yeah, I mean, depending on what state you're in. Like in New York, we don't do depositions of surgeons. We just exchange their reports and then we just, depo we just question them at trial. So for example, if a defense... Uh, insurance company lawyer, defense lawyer will have a deposition. Uh, they, they, they won't take a deposition of a treating doctor. They just, they're just bound by the medical records. And if they exchange an IME report, meaning a defense medical exam, um, you know, I don't get a deposition of their IME doctor either. I just get his report or her report. It's usually like two or three pages. I could send a watchdog to the IME, but I don't get the deposition. And then at trial, I just have to cross-examine them based on their report. I can get past transcripts where they've testified at other trials. Other states have depositions of doctors. Many states do. So you're probably not in New York, probably in another state if they're asking for to do a deposition. But yeah, if the, as long as it, the, the state law allows it, you know, of course, they, they're entitled to it. Um, it's fine. It's just deposition is just part of discovery. It's. It's fine. It's just uh, I'm sure the doctors know how to handle it, so it's not gonna it's not gonna be a big deal. Okay, and then Bernie also says, "Oh no, we, we did that one already." Okay, Bad Boy says, "When you settle for a high amount of money, do you get all of your money, or is it in bits and pieces?" I mean, no, you usually get all of it. There's something known as like structured settlements. Then you could maybe get it in pieces if you do a structure. But then you get more because the structure means that it's like being invested and it's growing. But usually you just get all of it. Okay. And then Unicorn has a big number. I don't even know what that is. A hundred billion, trillion, gazillion. Sounds good to me. <laughs> okay. And Matthew says, is it standard practice for oral argument when going for summary judgment in a labor law case? Um, I don't know if you mean labor law in New York. 
like a construction accident, then it depends on the judge. I mean, most judges will probably do oral argument. Yeah, because they'll have the papers and they'll want to do oral argument to like ask questions of the lawyers and further, you know, dive into any issues that may not be uh, clear in the papers. Um, so yeah, yeah, you do oral argument. Just depends on the judge. Some judges, you know, always have oral argument. Some judges actually, like there's a judge in Brooklyn where he does oral argument. I think now maybe he's, he got promoted. I think now he's in the appellate division, but he used to be in Brooklyn and he would do every oral argument on every motion with a court reporter and the court reporter would type everything, you know, so that most judges don't do that. Most judges just do oral arguments. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's fine. It's standard practice, I would say. Okay. And then Suzette says, hello. Hi, how are you? Oh, it's great to see so many people that I've met, like, and talked to, uh, as well as, uh, people who just watch the channel. It's awesome. And Hans is here. He says one year and a half after my accident discovery in a few weeks, but my lawyer told me the insurance hasn't offered a penny for my case. Defendant lawyer denies everything. Does that mean my case is bad? Well, no, it doesn't necessarily mean your case is bad. It just means that, you know, it could mean a lot of different things. It's hard to say. I mean, the real, the real, the best way to really determine if your case is bad is to think about like what happened, right? What are the facts? Is it a car crash? Is it a slip and fall? Who is at fault? Like sometimes people are at fault themselves. Sometimes the defendant that you're suing is at fault. And then number two, what is your injury? What is the damage to your life? How has your life changed? What was your life like before? What is your life like now after this happened? You know, the difference kind of showing the two roads. If you could show all that, then it's, it's not a bad case. But, you know, the defense lawyers, they're, they're doing their job. They're defending. It also could be the lawyer, right? The lawyer is not a good lawyer or is not handling it properly. They might not be able to get a good offer. So there's so many different possibilities. I couldn't really tell you from your comment, but I would, you know, if you need a consultation, just text me 347 566 I'll drop it in the chat too, 566-9595, just so you have my number. So I know some people say, when I say it, I say it too fast, and then they can't um, they can't uh, write it down or remember it. So yeah, I put it in the chat. You can just text me. Yeah, the important thing to remember also, if you text me, just give me those three things, right? The facts um, and the injuries. And also, you know, give me your name and your... Uh, your city that you're in. If I have those, those actually those four things, right? Name, facts of what happened, almost like you're watching it in a movie so you can see it. It doesn't have to be long. It could be like a sentence or two. But like if I could see, I see your name. Like my name is John. I got hit by a tractor trailer in the rear on the highway. I'm in, you know, whatever, Alabama. And my injury is I have a fusion in my neck. Okay, that's all I need, you know. I could give you a consult. But like sometimes people just start texting me, texting me these long things. Like, you know, I'm sorry, but I just can't like, you know, sit there reading like, you know, pages and pages of texts. I just have so much going on. So I try to respond to everybody. I think I even respond to the people that do the long ones, but it's better to just do the short ones. It's just so much easier for me than I could like take a note, you know, put it in my calendar, know what I'm talking about, who I'm talking with and plan everything out so I can give you the best consult because then it's better for you. Okay. Let's see. Andre says, Hey, what's going on? How are you? He says, appreciate you taking out the time to answer my question. My wife was hit by an 18-wheeler in December. Come to find out he did get ticketed and the insurance company did take fault. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. They do have a million-dollar policy. What do you think is the outcome of that? Also, she had a herniated disc. She got a concussion throughout this process, and she has PTSD and everything else. Yeah, I mean, that's that's I would I, I mean, I don't know what city you're in, but again, the, the better just text me because. You know, it's kind of hard to say just from a comment, right? But I mean, look, if you have true TBI with PTSD, that's post-traumatic stress disorder that happens. You know, I did a video about that too. If you search like my name and PTSD, you'll probably see it. And I go through all the, all the implications, but a PTSD could be as valuable as a true TBI, which is a traumatic brain injury. And your brain is like everything, right? It's your executive function. It's your memory. It's your emotions. It's, you know, it's everything, right? It's your brain. If that's how you live life. So, I mean, that could be many, many millions. I mean, absolutely, depending on what city it's in. And remember, if they say they have a million dollar policy, you have to check for excess and umbrella. They could have a million with a 25 million excess. And then you don't want to settle for a million, then you're giving away 25 million. So you got to be very careful. 
Okay, Nikimi says, hello, attorney. His long or how long should after deposition should attorney take to send settlement offer? I mean, after a deposition to get an offer, there's not really any set time. I mean, you can settle a case and get an offer before the deposition. You know, it's there's no set time. Really, the only reason you're doing the deposition is because the people involved, the lawyers, the decision makers, the adjusters. Remember, when you're going up against an insurance company, it's not just one adjuster. It's one adjuster assigned to the file. But that adjuster might only have authority for like up to 100,000. Then they have another adjuster from 100 to 500. Then they might have another adjuster from 500 to a million. You see what I'm saying? And it keeps going up. So there might be a, a lot of adjusters. There, there might be an excess adjuster that's responsible from like a million to 5 million, right? So what they want to see is they want to see all the pieces of the puzzle. If you could show them like what are the facts is this a good witness? Is this person answering the questions being posed? That's why they want to do your deposition. They want to know, um, you know, are we liable? Are we really at fault? Do we really have to pay? If this goes to court, are we going to have to get, are we going to get a jury verdict against us? We're going to have to pay a lot of money, right? Because we'd rather settle for less now than get hit for more later. Because between now and later, the only thing that's going to change is I'm going to have to pay this defense counsel, like, you know, three, $400 an hour for all the and he's billing me every week or every day for all this hourly work he's doing, right? So they just want to know about your case. So once they can see, hey, yes, the facts are against us, we're, we're liable, this person has a, an injury, like they have, like this other person has PTSD or they have like a fusion, you know, three fusions someone had, like something like that. Oh my God, of course, they'll, they'll want to settle with you. The only time they don't settle is if they think maybe I can get out on summary judgment, maybe the injury is soft tissue, so I'll, I could pay less. I could just pay like you know ten grand, or I could pay nothing. So that's usually what it is. Okay, Hans says I was rear-ended with a serious injuries, no broken bones, plus diagnosed with depression. One year physio, twice a week, still no offer from the insurance. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, but you know a lot of it depends on, you know, when you say serious injuries, like what are the injuries? You'd have to really like do, do a deep dive and look at the injuries. You know, where, what city you're in. Yeah, it's better to just text me because it's it's too hard to do something like that, you know, in a chat with, I mean, it's just, you know, based on a comment, I could be, I could be giving you wrong information because it's just like, oh, two, three, I guess it has a character limit, right? <laughs> so like the other person said who asked three questions. So I don't want to give you wrong information. So it's better to text me to 347-566-9595. Okay. And then uh, Nikimi says, my deposition was four months ago. My attorneys have not heard anything from the defense. Is it bad? It's not bad. I mean, like, what do you expect to hear? Like, the, there's nothing that the defense has to tell you after a deposition. If they deposed you, it just means they asked you questions. Like, how did the accident happen? What are your injuries? Then you have to, your attorney has to depose them, the people you're suing. You know, if it's a car crash, the driver, the owner, if it's a slip and fall, the manager of the building, whoever is responsible, right? Then um, you can file a a letter uh, and you could try to do a settlement like like I was talking about earlier the settlement opportunity letter but if you don't send the letter you know then they they never they never going to tell you anything it could go on for you know the case could just linger on like like that other person who had the 90 day notice right that means nothing is happening the case is just sitting there like in the storage yeah it could sit there for 90 days it could sit there for you know 9 months and nothing's ever going to happen so no, things don't just happen because of time like you have to be doing it you have to be prosecuting it as they say okay uniform unicorn finance says total recall total recall uh nikimi says can you do a video of cervical spine fusions yes absolutely i will do that i will do a cervical spine fusion um video i'm gonna try to do let me write that down too actually somebody told me artificial disc replacement verdict c-spine i'm gonna put c-spine uh, fusion verdicts. I'm gonna write it down just so I don't forget. I don't want to forget. See, I got my sticky notes. I'm gonna put it right on my monitor. So I'm gonna do it maybe next week. Maybe I'll research it a little bit, print it out. It's cool. I like this new site. It's a little expensive to subscribe, but I think it's worth it because it gives you, you could like read it on their screen. You could download it as a PDF so you could read it. You know, and you could even you could even send it, I think, to like a Kindle or whatever and read it on the camera. There's all these options. So it's kind of cool. You could I'm gonna to try to study it and uh, you know and give you some some input on cervical fusion verdicts. Okay, Ms. B says, Thank you, Mr. Freckman. I spoke to your 
a referred law firm and hopefully they see my case as serious and take me on as a client. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for reaching out. Yeah. And you feel free to text me directly as well. And we could chat. I don't know if I've spoken to this particular individual, but I think, yeah, if you reach out to me, if you ask me for like my recommendation of somebody like a good lawyer in, you know, wherever Anchorage, Alaska, Honolulu, Hawaii, you know, Los Angeles, California, Seattle, Washington, Florida, you know, Texas, Indianapolis, wherever. I have lawyers pretty much everywhere and I could vet that meaning I could check and make sure that they're real trial lawyers. They're good. They've gotten verdicts and settlements, you know, um, and usually maybe they're a member of one of my groups because I'm in the American Association of Justice. I'm in trial by human. I'm in trial lawyers college. I'm in uh, the American Association of Truck Attorneys, the American, uh, yeah, American Truck Accident Attorneys Association. It has an ma amazing truck a truck accident, truck crash lawyers. Some of those guys have, um, you know, taken verdicts for like 50 million on truck crashes. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I could find you know the person for you and give you a recommendation. It's better because like, if you just kind of go out and you're open, the yellow pages that go on the internet, who, who knows what you find? It's like hit or miss, you know, it's like, it's like Russian roulette. You might, you might succeed. You might, but you don't want to play Russian roulette with that because that's your life. That's your health. It's so important, you know? So, you know, thank you for saying that. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And then Seth says, hit by a commercial truck company. I have a prior auto accident, but it wasn't bothering me. Before the accident, I have a TBI recommended for ACDF. Could I settle before surgery for 500000 well, It's possible, depending on where you are. Oh, and I also had multiple injections and radio frequency ablation. That didn't help. Yeah, I mean, I think you could. I mean, you know, you'd have to probably file a lawsuit if you're looking for like half a million in most jurisdictions. Depends on the jurisdiction. But if you're hit by a commercial truck company, as long as they have enough, they should have enough. You know, commercial truck company should have at least a million or more. Um, so, uh, so you have a traumatic brain. But I don't know. I don't, I'm not really, I'm not sure I'm following what this says, but because I have a prior auto accident. So you're saying before you got hit by this commercial truck, you had another auto accident? But that wasn't bothering you. And then he says, I have a TBI. I mean, a TBI, like I said before, a TBI is worth multiple millions. And, oh, I see. And you're recommended for the ACDF, but you, you don't want to get it. Yeah, you could still. I mean, if you have a true TBI and it's proven medically, uh, along with the need for an ACDF that you're not going to have, that could be worth way more than 500000 just by itself. Okay. And then the next question is from B. Normally, how long does it take for an attorney to negotiate medical liens after the settlement documents are finalized? Oh, yeah, we just talked about that. So there's not really a time frame. It depends how many liens there are. If there's like one lien, it could be one phone call, 10 minutes, right? If there's a lot of liens with like Medicare, Medicaid, you know, like uh, workers comp, uh, then it could be months because it's just it, it's hard. Like Medicare, you, there's no one to call. You have to submit a form. It's the federal government. They might not just respond. They have like 90 days or 120 days to respond. It's such a bureaucracy. Just wait for them. So just, you know, it all depends. But usually if it's like a simple lien, like a doctor has a lien, you just call them up. Like I had a case when I settled my case that I did in the Bronx for 3500000 dollars I had this one doctor. He wanted 50 grand. We just called him up. We said, 50 grand, doctor. He's like, okay, I'll take 19. Okay, much better for the client, right? The client, I just saved the client 30 more grand. Because the client, you know, even even at 3.5 million, you know. People sometimes borrow money from funding companies. People have liens. He wanted a certain number in his pocket, and we were trying to get him that number, and we were successful, so he was really happy at the end. But you have to do that with the uh, with the liens. Okay, so we did the, the question about the liens. Um, Unicorn Finance says, as far as I know, 2024, no one can see in the dark. No one has night eye vision. Okay. Yeah, I guess, I mean, night eye vision, I guess they got those glasses, but I don't know if they work. The military maybe has those. Jetwing says, hi, Arcady. My pain management doctor has suggested a procedure that heats up the bulging discs with a hot needle. Are you familiar with that? That might be like a radio frequency ablation, I'm guessing. It doesn't like heat up. What it does is I think it burns the nerve, right? Because like you have the herniated disc, the herniated disc is leaking and it's touching the nerve. So then if you burn the nerve or you burn that, then like you don't feel the pain anymore because the, the pain fibers that cause the pain just get burned. Uh, that's my understanding of the radio frequency ablation. I don't know if that's what you're talking about. 
you wouldn't want to like heat up the disc. Uh, that wouldn't make sense. Cause heating it up, you know, cause the disc, the disc is like a jelly donut, right? So you just want the jelly to be inside the donut. If you squish it, like I did today, I don't know if you saw that part of my video, but I squished this thing, which was, this used to pop out. And now if I see there's a hole in it. And now when I, when I squish it, it actually actual, um, well, this way, actual liquid now comes out because there was liquid in there. And I guess I squished it too hard. I was talking on the phone to somebody. I was walking around and I just squished it <laughs> and the whole thing popped out. So now it doesn't work. But that's how, you know, jelly donut, like you want the jelly inside the donut. Once the jelly is outside the donut, that jelly that's outside the donut is going to be touching the nerves, causing you the pain. So that's all you need to do is just to, um, you know, probably they mean the radio frequency ablation to burn the nerves. Okay. And then Kayla says, what is the threshold to claim policy limit? Uh, the threshold to claim policy limit. I mean, there's not really any threshold. The threshold more applies to serious injury threshold, meaning you have to have a certain serious injury in New York. And if you don't qualify, there's nine different categories. It gets a little complicated, but the simplest ways are like just a fracture or, uh, and then if you have it, then you, you qualify for serious injury. If you don't have it, then you get, in case it's dismissed because in New York, all your medical bills get paid up to 50,000 and you lost wages. Now there's no threshold to claim a policy limit because all policy limits are different, right? Some are 25,000 and that's the limit. Some are 50,000 and that's the limit. Some are 10 million and that's the limit. So it's just, it's just judgment looking at prior cases, um, you know, experience. If you feel like you could get the policy, like the other comments I was talking about today, I felt like some of those people, they could and should get the policy, you know, and the policy was uh, a million. So I said, look, just demand a million. If they don't give it to you, then go to court and tell them you're going to go for, go for three. It's just like a window of opportunity, but there's no like specific threshold to claim a policy limit. Okay. And then uh, Andre says, my wife's case is in Houston. Oh yeah. yeah. Houston is a, is a great great place for uh, personal injury. I know a lot of excellent trial attorneys in Houston. So yeah, yeah, feel free. Actually, one of my friends from uh, college, he's an attorney in Houston. He's very good. He's actually, I think he was part of a team also that him and another lawyer, they got some crazy verdict, like 80 million. This was a, many years ago, but he's really good. Really good. He was actually, uh, when we were at college, we were on the debate team together and he actually went to Australia and he got second place in the whole world in speaking. So you can see this guy is good. Uh, but he's also a really smart attorney. Okay, Bruce Leroy says, could you do a review on personal injury case verdicts and settlements with traumatic brain injury and detached retina? I haven't seen any reviews on eye injuries. Yeah, sure, I could do a search. Let me write that down, detached retina. Yeah, I mean, detached retina is really serious, um, depending on the outcome, how they fix it, if it's permanent or if they get your eyesight back. But traumatic brain injury is always serious. I mean... Traumatic brain injury, it's hard to just like give you a value, you know, just with a comment that says TBI because there's all different types of TBIs and you really need to look at the um, the neurology, the neuroradiology, meaning the testing like the MRIs, the DTIs, all the different testings they do. And then you also need, sometimes you get a neuropsychologist that does like exams, like counting backwards, serial sevens, and then they have a whole report about like what's normal and how you compare to normal and then they say you are in the sixth percentile or whatever you're in the second percentile that means like 98 percent of the population is you know more normal than, than you so you have a deficit so there's there's some there's so much going on with tbi it's hard to to say but it, it could it could definitely be uh, a, a big you know they're usually big like multi-million dollar cases okay nikimi says so should my attorney send a settlement offer he has deposed the defendant yeah, I mean, I think so. It's, I, I like the settlement opportunity letters, like the window of opportunity, but not all attorneys even know how to do that. So it's a very specific thing. Uh, Just Riley says, what's further case management? Further case management? I mean, case management is just like moving the case along, managing the case. I don't know if you're talking about something you saw maybe when you logged into the court's website, uh, case management. Probably just the court, like managing the docket, managing the case. And Jaina says, I was injured on the Rikers Island prison transport bus as an inmate. Would, would I be at fault? I go for a deposition next week. Still haven't gotten any offers. Was told three witnesses did depositions. So you were on the Rikers Island prison transport bus. 
No, I mean, how could you be at fault? If you're a passenger on a bus, you wouldn't be at fault. It's whoever was responsible for the crash, if, if that's what it was. That's, you know, I don't know how the injury happened, but if it was a bus crash, then it would be the bus driver or the other driver it wouldn't be you. I mean, I'm guessing because you're, unless you're driving the bus, but you shouldn't be if you're, if you're, if you're, uh, you know, an inmate, you shouldn't be driving the bus. But yeah, yeah, I don't think you're at fault. Those are good cases. Passengers are always good cases because a passenger can sue, obviously, both cars, the car that you're in, known as the host vehicle, because of the, you know, you're there, they're hosting you, you're the, uh, the car you're in, and the other car, you can sue both. So those, those are great cases. Okay, MJ, hey, not sure if you answered this, but once the adjuster has everything, how long will a company like AIG take to respond? I mean, if you're sending them the old school settlement package, they usually get back to you in like 30 days, maybe 60 days. There's not really a hard and fast rule. Some people are quicker, some, some are slower. And Darren Proctor says, what is the value of back stimulator? I mean, again, it's hard to say because you need more information, but a spinal cord stimulator, it could be, it could be easily worth. I mean, usually you don't get a spinal cord stimulator by itself. It's usually you're getting it because of an injury, right, to treat a condition. So if that injury is serious, if you've also had surgeries, a spinal cord stimulator could be a big, could be a big injury. It could be, uh, you know, 500,000 millions. It could be many millions. It could be very big. Okay. And then Jetwing says, thanks, you're right. What does an RFA add in value to a case with other injuries? An RFA, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but I would say a radio frequency ablation it's a, it's a serious procedure. It's, it's one of the pain management procedures. So sometimes people get epidural steroid injections. Sometimes they get percutaneous discectomies or they get their RFA. What does it add? I mean, it's hard to say. I could do a jury verdict search on it. Probably the problem with even that is that it's not, no one's going to just have an RFA by, the, by itself, right? They're going to have an RFA, but they're going to have other injuries. It's kind of hard to isolate it. But I would say an RFA definitely adds value. It depends what else you've done. If you've already done, let's say, a percutaneous discectomy, you, you might not need an RFA. I mean, if, if you're thinking about it, hey, just to add value to the case, I wouldn't do it. If you really need it, like medically, then do it. But what does it add? I mean, probably adds, if, if, if that's all you have, let's say you have a herniated disc with an RFA and you have nothing else, it could go for a few hundred thousand, I would, I would guess. If in New York, probably. Okay, and then unicorn, is a settlement supposed to make things go away like nothing happened? What about if I use the funds to get revenge against the scumbags who all had their own personal agenda against me? Well, you know, I mean, you're not supposed to use the funds to get revenge. I mean, it's supposed to make, it's supposed to put you in the same place that you were before you got hurt. But that's the whole idea of it, right? Because we're not an eye for an eye society. Let's say somebody hits you with a tractor trailer, gives you a lifelong forever brain injury. You're not supposed to go out and, you know, injure the truck driver and give him a brain injury. What's the good in that? Now you have a brain injury. Now he has a brain injury, but nobody's any, and it doesn't help. So the way they do that is they have this insurance policy of like, you know, say a million with 10 million access and they pay you money to make things better. But the problem is, look, you're not going to get better in the sense of if you have that permanent brain injury, the money's not going to make the brain injury go away. But that's what we have in terms of civil justice. That's the only remedy we have. That's why it's so serious because there's some things in life that are priceless, right? Some things you can put a price on, like your medical bills or your lost salary for a week. You make 500 bucks a week, you miss a week of work. Okay, 500 bucks. But some things are priceless, like you just had a baby, you want to pick up your baby. You know, you can't pick up your baby. You have a brain injury, you can't even see, you You, you know, you, you can't even, or, or you, you have surgery on your arms, whatever, whatever the injury is, you can't pick up your baby. Now your life has changed. You're not the same person you were before, before you were like more vibrant, more vivacious, more, you know, uh, athletic, you would do stuff. Now you're, you're a shell of your former self, right? So that's the whole point. That's, that's why it's worth a lot of money because your life has been upended. And viral guy says, haven't heard from my lawyer since September. I don't even want to ask at this point. I just want to know if, when will I get a trailer date or, or a trial date after the deposition? I mean, I would call them if you haven't heard from them, that's not a good sign because they're supposed to be your counselor. They're supposed to be speaking with you. So, you know, feel free to text me, 347-566-9595. And Guseka says, hello. Hi, how are you? Uh, TBI concussion herniated disc. Yeah, TBI, I mean, like I said before in this live, TBI is very serious. 
And what is the policy limit for a private school, Darren asks. I mean, each, each private school will have their own, but I would guess a private school should be, should be a lot, should be at least a million, probably more. But you know, each school is going to be different. Okay. Here's one more question. Okay, we'll do one more question. I gotta go because it's the minute I'm too long. Two toy records. Arcady is a chiropractor neurologist, a good doctor to diagnose daily headaches. I've been diagnosed with daily headaches by a chiropractor neurologist and PTSD by a neurologist. Is that evidence enough? I mean, what I like to do, if it's a traumatic brain injury, what I like to do is get a neurologist that's familiar with traumatic brain injuries, and then they quarterback everything, meaning they send you to other doctors and they kind of manage your care. But you want to get a, a neuroradiologist. You want to do testing, like the 3T MRI, 3 Tesla MRI, that's going to show maybe possibly some of the changes, functional MRI, uh, diffuse tensor imaging. There's also... Neuroquant, there's a lot of different testing. There's arterial spin labeling. There's a, you know, there's a lot of different testing. It depends on what you need, what the doctor believes will be beneficial. And also there is a, you know, neuropsychologist, where they kind of sit and you do those tests and you spend like a day or maybe multiple days with them. And then they write a comprehensive report about all the different, you know, your learning style, your executive functioning, your memory. Like everything, it's very complicated, but you know, the, the, the doctors know how to do that. So yeah, but you know, feel free to text me if you have any questions, you know, it's a free confidential consultation, 347-566-9595. Uh, and I see Justin is here. I think that's somebody I spoke with. He says, hello, hi, how are you? So all the best to everyone. Please like and subscribe to our channel. We are here for you. Our goal is helping serious injury victims and families. All the best. Have a great night, everyone. Bye-bye.